Hello, and welcome to the Cretan War, which the Cretan War is an interesting event. It's 24 years long, and I very quickly decided I could make six introduction videos, or I could make one. I could get into the nitty gritty of every single battle, and probably will in the two and a half hour long live, or I could cover it in a way which would be thematically probably more relevant to people looking at current scenarios. And that is why we study history, of course, to try and divine something, some sort of advice for the present. The Cretan War is interesting because it uh, Christian War is interesting because it shows the limits of sea power. Kind of strange, some might say, for this particular channel to focus on, but um, yeah, there are limits. <sighs> Without much further ado, the Cretan War, 1645 to 1669, and I'm also going to grab from over here my notes, because believe it or not, this is attempt at recording number four. Not because the previous recordings have been bad, they've actually had the information in. But I didn't like the pronunciations. And I'm probably going to muck the pronunciations up again. But I hope I'm going to muck them up in a less bad way than I have before. <sighs> right then. Annoyance with myself coming through here. Now, the usual question I get when I'm starting for what, and before I get into too much, while I remember... If you like these videos, there's a subscribe button down there. There's also a little bell, I'm told, next to it. If you press that, you get notified when videos come out. And as Sal Murky Alango said uh, while we were recording the episode of Bilge Pumps, which comes out this week, which he was part of, he's a professor of maritime naval history in the US and a very, very interesting gentleman, and very, very smart on the ideas of the Merchant Marine. I do produce a fair amount of content. In fact, he thinks I'm going for 24 hours a day. I'm not quite going for that much, but, you know. Anyway. So. Hegemonic land power versus an economic maritime power. Now. At the moment, we don't really have many mar economic maritime powers that, you know, you would consider of the first world leading status. Venice and Mediterranean was the dominant power. For quite a while. Not always, but for quite a while. The Ottoman Empire was, in many ways, the superpower of its day. And I know people start to talk about the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburg Empire and this and that. But the Habsburg Empire is not contiguous. It cannot marshal its resources internally. So really, the Ottoman Empire is it. There is China, but China usually has to deal with so much internal issues. That, well, because it is it is quite so big and populous, that it doesn't really have the external capabilities. And the Mughal Empire, mm, for some reason, for all their advances, the Indian subcontinent and the empires there, again, never really evolve as a sea power and start really flexing their muscles. Probably it's to do with the formation, the various bureaucracy and organization within the state that that 
scenario, so, so, but we'll leave that to one side. You're dealing with Venice, which is very much an economic maritime power, which depends upon trade, which has a large navy, versus a nation, an organization, an empire, which is far more associated with land warfare, especially at this time, than it is sea. It's not a good thing that happens. What it was, well, the Croatian War, um, I cannot pronounce the Greek or the Turkish, but it's also known as the War of Candida. I have got the Greek and the Turkish up there. Um, in Italian, uh, Ger de Candida, and Subacroat, um, Candidiska Fra. Um, I, if I apologize specifically to my friend Anna, who tried to help me with that, if I made it too badly. <sighs> She's one of the PhD students at, King's, at Kingston. It's very, very smart on engineering that one, maybe. Right. The Fifth Ottoman Venetian War was a conflict between the Republic of Venice and her allies, which are not necessarily as useful as they sound. There's the Knights of Malta, who start the whole thing. Uh, there are the Papal States, who are big on we have status, not big on we're going to provide a lot of money or a lot of troops. And France, who's big on being French. Sorry, the the French alliances really doesn't serve the Venetians well in this time. What's interesting is really what they need is probably Spain to get involved on their side. But, you know, trouble is there's a 30 years war going on, so everyone else is kind of busy. Um, the English and the Dutch both have a habit of going for whoever's the highest bidder. <coughs> Quite happen often happens to be the Ottomans. The Ottomans have... Well, depending on the sources you read, they're either described as allies or vassals to Barbary states. It's an interesting mix. It's an interesting relationship, the Ottoman Empire with the Barbaries. Honestly, they caused the Ottomans a lot of trouble, but because they cause everyone else a lot more trouble, the Ottomans are prepared to tolerate them. And that, by the way, is one of the paintings of Candida. Now, the Siege of Candida is something which goes on Candia for a huge time for the conflict. It's pretty much, as long as the conflict's going on, Candida is under siege. And it is a really, really hard-fought siege. So, how does it happen? Well, this is where you need to start taking notes if you are a major power today. So, one of the minor powers, this is the Knights of Malta, who pretty much exist by legitimized piracy. That's the Knights Hospitalis, for anyone who's not sure. Decide to attack a convoy. This convoy contains people who are important, although they include the exiled Kisla Aga, uh, the chief black eunuch. Uh, Subal Aga, the Kadi of Cairo, and the nurse of the future, Sultan Mehmed the Fourth. Apparently, anyway, they're pilgrims. Um, bound for Mecca. So Subal Aga is killed. He's been exiled, so you wouldn't expect it to be really a massive thing, but it does turn into a massive thing, because there are people who want a war with 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 Venice, because there's been peace for many years, and Venice has been scrupulously following the peace treaty. And here's the pretext: the knights load their loot onto a ship, 
and then they docked on a small harbour on the south co southern coast of Crete, which was at this point Venice's most important, largest and richest colony. It disembarked some of the sailors and the slaves there because it's taken 350 men and 30 women as slaves. And this is the thing. The Venetians do not do the attack. They do not launch the attack. A ship, which is loaded with loot from the attack, docks in their colony. The trouble is... The Venetians have been using their money for other far more interesting things. They've had wars going on in Italy. They've had um, palaces to fix and all sorts of things. They haven't exactly been either fixing up Crete's defences and fortifications and making sure, despite them having some beautifully Italian design which we get into later, design fortifications, they haven't exactly been upgrading them. They haven't exactly been keeping their fleet in fully mobilized. They haven't been keeping a large garrison there. All these things, so everything's sort of fallen in a bit into disarray. And this is the pretext needed, because there's been peace, because they've been keeping strictly to the, strictly to the peace treaty. Uh... They basically accuse the Venetians of deliberate collusion with the knights. Um, even though the Venetians vehemently deny this, and honestly, the knights were a law unto themselves. It's kind of like accusing the Ottomans of controlling everything the Barbary pirates do. It's a case of how? Then. Mm. Anyway. So, negotiate. by the way, this event happens in 1644. And negotiations happen. The Venetians are pretty much trying to sort of get peace and all these things. Negotiations are still going on when the... How do I put this politely? Okay, so the Sultan, of course, is the head of the whole thing of the old empire. But reality, the day-to-day -day running of the empire is put in the hands of the Grand Vizier. So, you have the Sultan, who is, by virtue of bloodline, conquest, and various other things, in charge. The Grand Vizier is hmm, chosen by the Sultan. If they're sensible, they choose them to be smart. And they hope they're not ambitious enough that they decide they want to go after the top job. Because you need a smart one, because they're pretty much your prime minister. They're the person who runs the day-to-day -day country. It's, it's, it's slightly more... Sultans are very rarely hands-on, although this actual war does include a lot more hands some hands-on approaches from the Sultan... Um, the sultans usually get involved more in land campaigns than big sea campaigns where they are going to possibly be out of contact with uh, Constantinople, Istanbul as it becomes later on, uh, for a long period of time. Politically, that's not wise. So the Grand Vizier is your big boss and the one you can send out places. In British context, Lord Steward is probably the closest example. Now, originally, so, originally the Grand Vizier is actually opposing this, the one who starts off on this period, and here's Mehmed Pasha. So, instead of him being put in charge, the Sultan sends his son-in-law, Kapudian Pasha Sildar Yusuf Pasha, and when they sail, they tell everyone that they are not going to Venice. Uh, they're not going to attack Venice. They're not going to attack Crete. They're going after Malta. Which, let's be honest, would be far better. 
well, not so much far better as um, far more understandable because the actual Knights of Malta had actually done it. But Malta is a rocky crag, which at this point is not much of a prize. They're annoying, but they don't give you anything. Crete is a thriving community of 280,000 roughly people. It has a thriving agriculture, thriving port, trade. It's beautiful. You're about to hear about what happens when this uh, that sort of place gets subject to 24 years worth of war. But 50,000 troops and reputedly 416 vessels. So, you're all sitting there thinking, how in the name of all things holy, therefore, does a nation... Which uh, it's a colony which has been barely armed, barely funded, managed to survive against 50,000 troops and 416 vessels. How does the war go on for 24 years? Surely it should be over in about 24 minutes. Well, you have the pace of Ottoman advance. You have the fact that despite many joys, they're not all those troops are Janissaries. Not all the are Janissaries at all. And you also have the fact that, Lord help them, the Ottoman command structure is very, very poorly served. And the Venetian ones, despite the fact they don't put any funding or anything really into it, they actually seem to be served by some absolutely excellent officers. You do not know where they come from. The Ottomans have very good ones as well. But the Ottomans have many, many more, and the trouble is the Ottomans are either very, very good or definitely shouldn't ever be put in charge of anything. Should be given a carrot and told to sit at home and try and whittle with it. The Venetians range from very passive, but not going to lose anything too bad, lose anything, to absolutely super how do you manage to do that when you are outnumbered 10 to 1 so the battle starts as I, the reason i'm doing this today on the 29th of september is because the events which kicked off happen on the 28th of september many of the uh, uh, battles and issues happen in september and um, Although the Ottoman fleet actually arrives in Crete on 23rd of June, 1645. So, the skirmishes and early battles. It's a lovely painting. It is a lovely painting. Now, the Crucian Navy couldn't interrupt the 416 ships. They just, they, the Venetian Navy couldn't interrupt 416 ships. They had no chance and they knew it. So their fleet did possess roughly 60, between 60 and 70 galleys, uh, four galleys and about 36 galleons. They were able to actually use them. And that's the thing. The Ottoman Navy is all about galleys. It doesn't have any galleys at this point. That's going to be something which comes about in about 1648, which we'll talk to about in a second. So, it's, hmm, three years down the road before they start ordering galleons. Up until then, they basically, and even after then, they really are relying on English and Dutch to bring the galleons. So the privateers are coming again. And there's an interesting story, which was never, if not really proved, but then um, Charles II's wife wanted him to get involved in the war to help relieve Candia. And um, whilst he was sort of demurring and talking about of her, he may or may not have been sponsoring, um, well, investing in several armed merchant ships which went out to fight for the Ottomans. So while his wife is requesting that he officially intervenes on the side of Christendom, 
he is making money outfitting stuff for the Ottomans. I think he was a lucky man that he usually had armed guards around him. I think that might even top forgetting a wedding anniversary, that one. Uh, the first Venetian attempts to blockade the Darnals take place in 1646, but it really doesn't have much of an effect. Um, the ships are sent under Tommaso Morosini, who is a fairly experienced naval commander and a very good one. He's not as good as Francesco Morosini, who we'll discuss later, but he is good. He tries his best, and he does pretty darn well. Uh, they manage to try and first take, find Ottoman shipping in the Aegean and attempt to capture the strategically important island of Tenedos. Um, then the Kapudan Pasha Koka Musa, who, yes, I must, uh, terrible name, leads a fleet of 80 warships against the Venetians. But the 23 ships of uh, Thomas's force managed to drive them back into the Dardanelles. Please, yes, you know, 23 versus 80. However, the blockading fleet wasn't able to stop any of the, you know, the Ottoman fleet exiting on the 4th of June, um, when, basically due to wind, enabled the Ottoman galleys to evade the Venetian sailing ships, and so they were able to land new troops and supplies on Crete unopposed. So... And then... The Venetian fleet attempts to try and get involved in the land operations on Crete were had pro run into problems of timidity of commanders and not paying the crews. Relied on paid crews. Crews don't fight if they ain't being paid, and if they don't think they're going to get paid. <sighs> so the Ottomans are still managing to get resources through to Crete. And this is important. They landed their troops initially. They managed to uh, capture some things initially, but not much, but enough that they get there through quickly. But they really haven't got a supply base. Crete, uh, Crete is not the area which you go to for supplies if you've got a large army. It's the area you go to to get high-value goods and for important trading connections. It's important as a hub, not as a producer in this period. Not of, you know, crops and things which are going to feed a large army anyway. In 47, unfortunately, Tommaso Morosini dies. Um, he is... Um, this is an interesting thing. He dies, his ship, Solo, takes on 45 galleys. Manages to cause significant casualties to the Ottomans, including killing Koka, uh, uh, Koka Musa Pasha himself. Whilst Morosini gets killed, his ship actually survives and is rescued by the timely arrival of the rest of the Venetian fleet under Giovanni Barista, uh, Battista Grimani. Now, the estimate is that that single ship managed to take out and severely damage up to 30 of the uh, Ottoman galleys. One ship, 30. Okay. And they're still not winning this war. This is the point. They are managing to dominate at sea. If the Royal Navy had had an engagement where HMS Warspite took out I'd say equivalent of the galleys in the city. 30 of 
Italy's 45 destroyers in one engagement. That would have been, woohoo, we're winning. World War II is done. We have won the Mediterranean. This one, it, 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 it's not even phasing the Ottomans. They're still coming back for more. Um, the Venetians managed to return to Darnells in 1648. However, Grimani himself gets killed in a storm in mid-March, and they lose many ships, but uh, Giacomo de Riva brings up reinforcements, and they get up to a strength of about 65 vessels, which allows them to successfully blockade the Straits for a whole year. So they're managing to blockade the Straits for a whole year. However, yes, they blockaded the Straits, but supplies are still managing to reach Crete for the army of the Ottomans from Alexandria, from Cyprus, from other places in the Aegean that the Ottomans control. Cyprus, of course, had been one of the subjects of a previous war. So... Really not a lot of success going on here. Uh, the Revision, uh, Venetians are now going to face another problem, because at this point, the Sultan calls a meeting of the cabinet, or the equivalent of the cabinet, at this point, all his senior viziers, pashas, and all the rest of people, and... It seems that whilst they've kept trying to say, oh, no, no, the war is going well, we're doing... Well, somehow the Sultan had realised after a single ship beats up 45 of his ships, he's got a problem. Which point he decides that, well, despite the protestations of at least one senior officer, uh, that Allah will still preserve, uh, provide victory, He seems to, the Sultan seems to take the idea that, in this case, Allah has pointed out that victory will not be done unless you get one of the, you get, start to get some galleons of your own. Um, God can work miracle, uh, you know, the Christians themselves are relying on God to make up for their numbers, and so far it seems to be working. I'm not going to get into this too much, but the old joy is, of course, that Christianity, which I am, broadly speaking, worships the same God as Islam and Judaism. It's always been my understanding. One of them. They just have different approaches to the worship and different adaptations of it. Various extremes. In all of them. But leaving that to one side, there had clearly been some divine providence going on, showing him what needed to be done. Either that, or you have to accept that Thomas O'Morrisini was, I don't know, Nelson, pre Nelson. Now, so in 1649, a strengthened Ottoman fleet. Under Kapudun Pasha Vonik Ahmed, again, they keep getting his orders, managed to break out the blockade. Uh, they have managed to build a new fleet at Sesam, which forced the Venetians to divide their forces. However, the Riva, the Venetian commander, is able to, Giamaco de Riva, is able to score a significant victory over the Ottoman fleet at its anchorage in Phoenicia on the 12th of May, 1649, uh, but isn't able to stop them eventually reaching Crete. And at which point, once they get to Crete, they're able to do what they want. They're able to resupply the horses. For most of 1650, a Venetian fleet of 41 vessels maintains a blockade of the Darnells, prohibiting Haragaz Mehmed Pasha from sailing to Crete. 
He was replaced later in the year by Hosomade Ali Pasha, govern the then governor of Rhodes, who used um, an interesting ploy for getting through the blockade. He waited until winter when the Venetians withdrew their forces, assembled a small number of ships, and embarked several thousand troops with many provisions and sailed on the list of the Crete. So, um... Basically, uh, to start off with, they had managed to stop them, and then Rhodes, Governor Rhodes, gets passed by just waiting till winter. Because the Venetians withdraw their fight and their fleet in winter, because no one fights in winter. What kind of uncivilized brute are you? I'm always reminded when I'm reading this of a raw, what the Royal Navy would call a bish, a vicar, um, who gave a sermon once at one of my junior school, I think it was. And in it, he said the immortal words. He said, God gives you the tools so you can help yourself. And he helps those most who help themselves rather than sitting around waiting for him to tell him what to do all the time. I think it's your view as to whether the world is ordained by someone who wants to micromanage everything. Anyway, leaving that, and leaving that mutterings about religion, to one side. Let's hope this doesn't be too quiet the whole time. Okay, so that should be better. <sighs> On the 10th of July... Uh, 1651, the first what is significant naval battle of the war was fought on south of Naxos. This is a war which has been going on now for about six years. Has involved engagements of 50 or more ships fighting. They have not been considered a significant battle. There's a three-day engagement in which the Venetians, with 58 ships under Alvis Masengio, Managed to beat a Ottoman fleet, which is estimated, and I put this as estimated, to be somewhere in region of 120 ships. The Ottomans managed to withdraw to Rhodes. However, from there, they are able to again resupply Candia. So... Mashingo is replaced by Leonardo Fossolo. Uh, but for the next two years, there is nothing much really accomplished. In fact, honestly, for the next two years, the Venetians are doing an ineffective blockade and the Ottomans are coming at it from different angles. Why are they able to do this? What's going on? Why is the superior maritime power losing in a maritime war? Well... The only answer I can give you is the Venetians are placing significant strain on the Ottomans to adapt to and overcome to try and avoid them. However, their commanders are being incredibly conservative. They do not want to lose men and material because they know they are fighting the war on a shoestring budget. And it's kind of the exact opposite of the Royal Navy's often quoted philosophy of war fighting. Uh, if in doubt, attack the enemy. This is, if in doubt, try and block the enemy. Don't attack them. We don't want to lose things. Occasion, though, commanders change. So. In 1654 you start to finally have results coming from that critical part of it, the Imperial Arsenal in Constantinople, a critical part of it for the Ottoman Navy. It's where the galleons and the sailing ships start to come forth. These are the critical vessels that they are now going to base it. So the Ottoman makes the, the, Ottoman, the Sultan makes the decision that all the way back in 48, it's six years later. Why? 
you need seasoned wood, you need enough of it, you need to learn what you're going to do with it, and you need to get these ships in enough numbers. But, six years later, including quite a hefty amount of ships which are of English and Dutch origin, and possibly of Norwegian origin as well, but we're less certain about those. And they could be Dutch, just a weird name, but mm, there was something written. They sail a fleet out in 1654, 40 sailing ships, 35 galleys, and six galleases. So that's 79 ships to start off with. And it grows to 115 vessels with 22 galleys and 14 more ships coming from various points in the Aegean and the Barbary. Now, this force considerably outnumbers 26 ships of the Venetian blockade in fleet under Giuseppe Dolphin. So, what am I going to say here? Although the battle that followed results in an Ottoman victory. Well, hey, for the Ottomans! We outnumber the enemy 4-1 to one and we finally won a battle. The Venetians managed to escape with all their ships intact. So, Candle's moral victory. And... After a brief skirmish with the Venetians under Alvis Marchengel, um, they just basically sail back and forth across the Aegean for the whole for the rest of the year, and dodging them is just And they end up returning. The, uh, the the for this point is the first time you have contested sea control. You have the Ottomans actually contesting, and then you have problems with the Janissaries who are aboard, and they start complaining and intriguing and all sorts of issues. So Karamur Pasha ends up having to return in September to the Dardanelles. <sighs> However, at this point, Mashengo dies. Mashengo has been in charge, but has got very, very conservative in his running of the Venetian Navy. And things go to Francesco Morosini. Remember, we talked about Tommaso Morosini earlier. Tommaso, of course, was the one who, despite outnumbered 45 to 1, whipped ass. Excuse the French. Died, but won. Uh, did a lot of uh, fighting. Luckily, Francesco is not that different. Um, very, very much more energetic. Uh, he raids the Ottoman supply depot in Algina and raises the port town of Volos in a night attack on 23rd of March. This is in 1655. In early June, he sails to the Darnells, awaits the side of the Ottoman fleet. Um, when they are delayed because of political upheaval, uh, he decides to leave Lazzaro Masengo uh, in charge with half the fleet, that's a mere 36 ships, to keep watch on the straits. And um, he himself returns to Sekalides uh, to keep an eye on it. A week after his departure, on 21st of June, the Ottoman fleet numbering 143 sh ships under Mustafa Pasha appears. Uh, the resulting battle is a complete Venetian victory. So the Ottoman fleet then avoids action for the remainder of the year before it withdraws to winter quarters, uh, which allowed Morosini to undertake a um, siege of Mavizia, which was an important island fortress off the south coast of Peloponnese. And in September, though, after proving an absolutely amazing sea commander and really reinvigorating it, what do the Venetians do? You know, we've got this great naval commander. He's He's driving back the Ottomans. He's given us a big victory. He's managing to bottle up the Ottomans. He's managed to stop most of the supplies reaching the forces in Crete. He's amazing. He's amazing. What should we do with him? 
Marcini's posted as the new Provedor of Crete. And his deputy, Lorenzo Marcello, is made the new Captain General of the Sea. So, you know, okay. You haven't completely gone nuts, but why? You have someone actually doing the job well. Um... Despite usually holding the upper hand in the, in the Aegean, the Ottomans were still free to roam the Aegean and resupply their forces in Crete. They often managing to get through thanks to the winds, the station keeping the forces, and the resupply of the Venetian ships, and the frigging problems with pay and leadership. You had to be a very good leader to get the Venetian sailors to follow you quite happily, because they are often a combined alliances and often came from various other powers. So. Uh, Morosini thanks in part to Francesco, thanks in part to Tomasos, but also his own fighting prowess, had managed to weld the Allies together quite well. Basically, they bicker for status underneath him, but they would do what he said. That's important. But, you know, they're a bit of an issue. Um, frankly, thanks to their supply, the uh, Ottomans, as I will mentioned, their supply fleets from Alexandria, Rhodes, Chios, or Maversa in Palanese, all were sending supplies. In June 1636, however, a combined Venetian Maltese fleet of 67 ships under Marcello um, managed to defeat the 108 ships under Kenan Pasha, uh, giving them uh, the Ottomans their worst naval defeat since Lepanto. Uh, Lepanto, 60 Ottoman ships were destroyed, 24 captured, and 5,000 Christian galley slaves set free, although the Venetians and Maltese suffered casualties um, too, including Captain and General Marcello. You notice this? The Venetians, they keep losing their good commanders, and they redeploy some of the others. They just... They have really, really good commanders, and they have some fairly good commanders. As I said, conservative ones and aggressive ones. The aggressive ones, because they're leading from the front, keep going. Uh, Marcello's ship, I think, is another one which has severe damage. And the aftermath victory, the Voltese contingent departed. So they didn't want to serve under the next commander uh, who was coming after Marcello, because, frankly, they trusted Marcello. They had had great respect and trust and faith in Morosini. The next bloke, they thought, why are you sending him? This was a point at which Marcello's died. It would be more sensible probably to have sent out Morosini, but Morosini's trying to survive the situation in Crete. And the situation in Crete is bad enough. They're pretty much down to Candia at this point, which we'll get to in a second. That's the next slide. Um... The Venetians actually directed by Morosini, but under different commanders. But he's basically trying to organize everything while from Crete. He's, he's 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 trying to act as strategic director for the war because there isn't any at this point. Um, managed to seize uh, Barbadur to see uh, under Bar and under the direct command of Barbadur, who's the Barbado Doa, who's a sub commander, seized Teneros on the 8th of July and Lemnos on the 20th of August. Um, using these two islands, they managed to hold uh, the entrance to Straits and pretty much man it makes the Venetian blockading regime far more effective. This actually has a great big strategic impact. And at this point, if they had really pursued peace, they could probably could have made it because you have controlled the entrance to the Dardanelles and you're pretty much cutting off not just supplies going to Crete, but supplies going to Constantinople. So you're starving both ends. 
but you're going to guess what happens. In 1657, the Ottomans managed to reverse the situation. Um, thanks to Grand Vizier Kopro Mehmed Pasha, who's basically due to the situation given all the powers he could ever want. And this is pretty much one of the first times a Grand Vizier goes involved or gets involved in these themselves. Um, he takes over strategic command. And the fleet strengthened, put on the Kapudan Pasha, to, a new Kapudan Pasha, Topol Mehmed. And in March of 1657, the Ottomans succeeded in evading the Venetian blockade straits and sailing towards Tenedos. They did not attack the island, they because the Venetian garrison was mahusive for its size. And they're sort of sailing around disputing Venetian control. In May, the Venetians under Lazaro, Lazaro Masengo. Notice the keep, names keep turning up again. Um, almost as if families are involved here. Achieved some minor victories on the 3rd of May and two weeks uh, later at Sizak. Uh, reinforced by papal and Maltese ships, Masengo sails to the Dardanelles, awaiting the renewed sally of the Ottoman fleet on the 17th of July. Um, Unfortunately, though, here is the classic problem. Masengo is not a bad commander, but he's not got Morosino's, Morosini's power, Morosini's presence. So the, the Christian commanders aren't really organized. The Ottoman fleet managed to exit Narrows before the battle is joined, and when the battle takes place in the free, next three days, um, an explosion destroys the Venetian flagship and the Allies are withdrawn. So, whilst the Venetians managed to inflict, and their eyes managed to inflict a lot heavier casualties on the Ottomans than they'd suffered, the blockade was broken, and the Grand Vizier then managed to direct to command, managed to, with support from the Barbary states, managed to proceed to recover Lemnos and Tenedos, and stop and take, wipe out their entire successful victory in previous times. So what's going on on Crete at this point? Because we've been talking a lot about sea. What's going on Crete? Well, basically, most of Crete has fallen other than Candida. As I keep calling it. And that's wrong. Excuse me a second. So, the Siege of Candia. This is one of the biggest operations going on the whole time. And the whole time, there is... A lot of fighting going on. There is a lot of action involved, mostly in terms of digging trenches. And, well, if I do this, you can see it properly. Now, it lasts for 21 years. And it is a mass example of trench warfare, of mines and countermines being dug both in terms of the Ottomans trying to get underneath the Venetian positions, the Venetians trying to get underneath the Ottoman trenches, which are bringing artillery slowly closer and closer to the walls to make it, you know, more practical for them to make holes in them. And you've got the Venetian fleet off the coast. Now, here's the thing. Neither side is really able to blockade the other. Both sides are getting supplies of troops, men, material in. And by the end of it, Candia is a wreck. It's a ruin. It's absolutely destroyed. It lasts for 21 years. But that is going on the whole time. It doesn't matter how much sea power the Venetians put in, that never really gets changed. They never manage to successfully block off the Ottoman supplies. They never manage to use their position to negotiate from strength. And Candia itself, when you look at its fortifications, and you look at the fortifications versus the planned fortifications, the Venetians had had beautiful plans drawn up and then hadn't provided the money to actually build them. 
if they built those fortificate those fortifications, they might have actually been able to last longer. They might have made it even more difficult for the Ottomans to have get the control they would have done. They'd have certainly made it the attack from the northeast versus the northwest much, much more difficult of Candia. Uh, the no northeast would have still been viable because it's the flatter, easier land to get in. But you could have made the northwest pretty much an impossible place to attack. And you could have made the northeast uh, the Ottomans have to base their camp back the other side of the river. It wouldn't have made things amazingly easier, but if you have a larger space to bring troops into and you can force the enemy to keep further away from you, then they are going to take longer to get closer, but it's also going to require, it's going to make their position far more difficult. If you can also make it so that they only have a single avenue of attack, then your troops can concentrate far better to deal with that threat and that attack. And when you are doing things like sallying out to attack and try and force them back and all those things, uh, which is where the French lose a lot of officers and a lot of Venetian noblemen get killed. And this is where actually a large number, half the casualties on both sides get inflicted during the war in Candia. then you might have had far more success because, frankly, this is a classic example of don't skimp on defense spending. <laughs> uh, you have something which is critical. You have several islands. Uh, if the Venetians had actually built the defenses they'd planned during the 60 years of peace they'd had with the Ottomans and just, and just funded them adequately, had relatively small garrisons, but used the financial incentives and things they'd plan on setting up to set up militias on the island. They did have militias on the islands anyway. If they had their militias strengthened by some regular garrisons and uh, Crete might well not have fallen. The If the Ottomans hadn't gained control of ports early on, they couldn't have sustained the forces they did on Crete. If they couldn't have sustained the forces they did, they could never have laid siege to Candia to the as to some of the other major places they were holding that they did. Anyway, so what went wrong? How does uh, an on paper superior maritime power not win this war? Well. Look at the estimated people who died. The Venetians lose 62,000, roughly. The Ottomans lose 238,000. Crete's population drops from an estimated 280,000 to 80,000. Crete's population mostly disappears elsewhere. They get out of the fighting, they get away. Or they get taken as slaves and back to the Ottoman Empire, or all sorts of things. They get killed, quite a lot get killed. But also, they have no food to sustain them because the island gets ravaged. 24 years of war. 24 years of war. It gets ravaged. It gets absolutely ravaged. And that's not a fun thing for anyone to deal with. The Ottomans always have internal issues. The Venetians also have their own internal issues with how they deploy their commanding officers for starters. And where they get and what they do with them when they've got good ones. The Ottomans win, but the Ottomans win at a huge cost. And this is the interesting thing because there are various myths which always go on about the Ottoman Empire and about what stopped its advance through Europe, what stopped it. 
in many ways, this war, the Cretan War, is what guts the Ottoman Empire. It leads to a lot of internal strife and a lot of officers getting killed. It a lot, a huge number of junior officers get killed. A huge amount of resources have to get used. A huge number of issues get built up because the Ottomans have to ignore fiefdoms being built in certain areas as long as they are supplying the battlefront. So, the Crucian War is a war for absolute victory, and neither side's really prepared to settle for anything left. At certain point, right up until the end, the Greek Venetian negotiating position was very, very strong, and they could have had a peace where they settled for half of Crete, all sorts of things. They didn't want to do that. Eventually, they end up concluding peace, losing Crete, because Candia falls. And when you lose Candia, you have no stake in Crete. But it's not all about Crete, despite it being called the Cretan War. Um, in Dalmatia, the Venetians managed to get several successes. And the Ottomans lose, as I said, a lot. So the Ottomans win the war, but it's a very much a Pyrrhic victory. They have lost a lot of what makes the Ottoman Empire successful to win a war against what was, at this point, not a minor power, but certainly not a foremost power. So where is the funny? Twitter, at AC underscore Naval History, Patron, and AC Naval History, and Globe Maritime History. Patrons are especially important as they help, and they're what I use for my book fund at the moment. So thank you very much to everyone who's a patron. It's really, really important. And you can also find some merchandise there because I'm slowly starting on the merchandise route because I've been asked to. And I thought it might be fun. Plus, Drac produces cool pieces of things like this, which he sent me. So, you know... That suggests to me merchandise can be really, really cool, and I should get into this because that's I, I have plans for tribal class destroyers. I know. Thank you. And what else do we have come out? Uh, well, October this Thursday, we have World War One in the Far East, uh, Battle of Penang and Siege of Singtao. Uh, Sunday fourth, Brew Ships Twenty, a Brasses and Jane specials. Where the uh, these books are going to be taking centre stage, and several Jane's books are going to as well. Uh, Patron eight, the Treaty of London, nineteen thirty, by Daniel Freeman. King's College London's Lords and Sunrise right, is on Thursday eighth. Sunday eleventh, Brew Ships, twenty one leadership. Um, let's see, Monday the twelfth to Friday sixteenth of October, we have a research week. So there will be some long patrols coming up, and long patrol themed will be early video, early powerpoints, early videos redone as long patrols, basically using all the news text. So I'm going to not, I'm not going to replace the old videos. They're not going to go away. I like having the videos up there, which are how this thing started with me showing up things like my slides and going, here you go, here's my slide. Um, but I do want to read in them, because I think I can do them better now. Uh, Patron 9, Suez Goes Hot in 1956. We're spending a lot of time in in the Mediterranean this week. Uh, this year month, uh, well, October. And then 22nd of August, Ships That Fisher Scrapped, scrapped as suggested by Jeff Grenard. And then Amphion Class Cruisers on the 29th. Now, there is a reason there's a gap there. And that is because Tuesday the 27th, was supposed to be a day which was going to be very busy, and Brew Ships 23 on the road is also going to change. Brew Ships 23 is going to be new books, uh, book reviews, which is going to be far more in-depth look at those books than having a lot of books, but it's going to be focused on those. And the 27th, I'm, again, still looking for suggestions. 
because I was going to be away and wasn't sure what I was going to do, whether I was going to build it, research time, put up a long patrol, anything. Now I'm going to be at home. I'm going to be working from home. So what would you like? Anyway, that's been an hour. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching, and take care. Just before I go, if you have enjoyed this video and you have enjoyed the others, please do remember there is a subscribe button down below and a little bell. If you click on, you get notified of when I have the videos. Now, you might all wonder again why I keep doing this and why I keep saying I'm being reminded of this. Well, I have, as you know, a lovely girlfriend. And she decided, because I was doing lots of YouTube stuff, she should watch the YouTube, uh, some other videos and see what other people are doing because see how to get, uh, how to be more successful or in her views to, um, as I said, I was professionalizing, work out what made professionalize. And basically she has told me that I need to do this because <laughs> apparently other people do this a lot and a lot more than I do. Hmm. I'm just glad someone's taking interest. Anyway. Thank you very much to everyone who does take an interest. Thank you to everyone who does vote in patron voting, who suggests topics. Thank you to everyone who watches. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed. You're all amazing. And you've done uh, given me a lot more fun than I thought I was going to get. And it's going to carry on going because I enjoy doing this. I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy the feeling of having an ongoing I'm calling it I, I picture in mind as an ongoing aspects of naval history and maritime history in Montreal. That's how I'm approaching. Anyway, thank you very much and take care.